right, everybody. Okay. I'm developing a series of stories that have a consistent theme. Some call it coincidence, others call it happenstance, some even call it divine intervention. I call it when serendipity and synchronicity meet at the intersection of wow and boo, magic happens. This is one of those stories. It was the summer of 1986. I had just gone through a jag of workshops about finding the one if there even was one to find. Or if there wasn't the one to find, well, then at least I'd be okay with that. And I was. I was okay with that. At that point, I envisioned myself at 90, a wild, devil-may-care gypsy, free-spirited, untethered, a wise woman sage with a horde a gaggle of handsome, nubile young men willing to service me <laughs> whenever, wherever, and however I chose. That was a, com a comforting thought. I sighed a sigh of relief. If I was to be alone, so be it. And anyway, at the time I was dating up a storm of lust. Nothing serious, but let's just say I was very popular. My friend Helen called and invited me to go to an event with her. She was doing a play about AIDS, and this was going to be a big fundraiser for the AIDS community. It was being hosted by Liz Taylor and Ted Danson. I said, okay, I'll go. It sounds like fun. By late August of 1986, I was beginning to feel like a lot of things were late. I wanted to find the one. I was tired of dating, going through the cycle of cute meat, Infatuation, disillusionment, uncomfortable and painful breakup. Then rinse and repeat again and again and again. <laughs> I had been a consciousness junkie for over a decade and had done just about every seminar you could imagine. I had done Est, Schmest, and all the rest. <laughs> then I did a seminar called Making Love Work, which sounded like a seminar to make relationships functional but it felt more like it was making love a chore, you know, making love work. <clears throat> I tried another seminar. This one was on Native American spiritual sexuality. It was interesting, but I ended up with no feathers in my cap. Desperation led me to invent a precursor to speed dating. I called it 15-minute coffee dates. I figured I could squeeze three or four in over the course of an evening. The only result was kidney stones from too much coffee. I even tried to use a phallic-shaped crystal as an imaginary fly fishing rod to cast a line into the Los Angeles dating pool to reel in my soulmate, but nothing. Out of the blue, a friend invited me to an AIDS benefit. She said she bought a table and asked if I would like to go. Have dinner, be part of an interesting evening. I didn't really want to go, but I figured, what the heck? I was in show business. What respectable actor or writer ever turned down a free dinner? <laughs> so it's the day of the event, and my friend Helen calls and says that I would have to go to this AIDS benefit alone. Alone? <laughs> what? Why? She then tells me she got an unexpected call to go to New York immediately to do a movie of the week. She said, look, dinner is paid for. You're a vegetarian, so you'll have a delicious, overcooked, soggy vegetable plate, just the way you like it. You'll be at the head table with the gay mafia, surrounded by lots of other gay men who will absolutely adore you. You are going, just go, go downtown to the Biltmore Hotel alone? Oh, God. Okay. So I got all dolled up, went over to my mom's for the once over. She went on and on and on, and on about how darling I looked and how brave I was to go to this event alone. When I got to the Biltmore, I suddenly realized something. Oh, crap. Where am I supposed to park? I didn't bring any money. The night was already paid for. 
So there I was, alone in a very bad part of downtown LA. It was just me and Skid Row and Pershing Square, filled with homelessness, wino dumb, and danger. I had to park at the hotel, so I took a deep breath and pulled into valet parking. There was no self-parking, believe me. This was LA, and it was $10 with a validation. I prayed for a little miracle. I walked into the hotel, and there was my miracle. My old friend, Vince, who was now working as a cameraman for ABC News. He was there to cover the event. He spotted me the $10 for parking, and I was good to go. As I folded the $10 bill tightly and shoved it into my purse, I smiled, knowing that my gift of finding serendipity and synchronicity was still alive and well and making its usual magic. I arrived early at the elegant Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. I like to be early, so I could scope out the sitch to give me the illusion that I was in control of something in my life. Of course, I wouldn't really be in control. In fact, being early might only give me more opportunities to stumble into embarrassing circumstances where I could brilliantly demonstrate how little control I actually had. <laughs> the evening began in a smaller than grand ballroom where wine and crudité were served. I grabbed a wine and worked with the carrots on the hors d'oeuvre platter. Experience taught me that the celery always had a hidden pothole of problems with those stringy ribs that can get caught and make you sutz the whole night trying to get that celery floss out from between your teeth. <laughs> People started showing up. In my mind, I was a suave, debonair cross between Sean Connery and Cary Grant, standing there with my wine in one hand, my carrots in another, as I scanned the room my highly trained senses were like high-tech radar, alert, focused, sensitized, and attuned. Extrasensory antennas scanning the horizon, a heat-seeking love bomb searching for anyone who might look interesting to talk to. As I entered the bar adjacent to the ballroom where dinner would be, I wondered how to while away some time without having a drink to fiddle with. I figured I'd just stick with the carrots and hope I wouldn't have any orange flecks left peeking out from my teeth. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I thought I recognized a familiar face. Who was that? God, I know that face, and it's coming toward me. Then I saw her, an attractive brunette with sparkling eyes in a long black velvet dress holding a napkin full of carrots. She was pretty, yes, but she looked familiar. And we already had carrots in common. <laughs> Suddenly, I realized a miraculous thing. I did know her. Yes, the pretty face belonged to a casting director who, if memory served me, liked my work. I had a great audition with her a while back. This was perfect. All I had to do was walk across the floor, say hello, and engage her in conversation. Then she would tell me she was casting a new series and there was a small part for which I might be right. I would get the part, be brilliant, inspire the show to write me into a recurring role. The recurring role would lead to my own series, an Emmy, films, and an Oscar. It was a done deal. All I had to do was simply walk across the floor Say hello, and my future was made. The hell with my soulmate. This was show business. I watched as this tall, lean, handsome-faced, well-dressed, salt-and-pepper, tousled, curly-haired guy sauntered across the room, clearly heading in my direction. Then, for one split second, it looked like he hesitated and was going to veer off. Just then, I remembered his name, Richard. I confidently took my first sure-footed step across the floor, buoyed by the indisputable fact that my entire future career was now on solid footing. Three steps out, my confidence weakened. Wait, did that pretty face belong to a casting director? Five steps out, I had the answer, no. 
I was wrong, really wrong. It wasn't the casting director, but who was it? She looked familiar. I didn't want to look like a complete idiot, so I prepared to veer off to the right and head to the bar for a refill. <laughs> but right before my veer, the woman looked directly at me, smiled and nodded in recognition. I was stuck. I had to go over and say hello. Each step was like the Bataan death march, bringing me closer and closer to humiliation. Who was it? Who was it? Finally, I had a flash. One letter. A great big capital R. But nothing else. Just a single solitary R. I casually walked up and said to this familiar stranger in my most suave debonair voice, Hi, you're Rala. Ra ra yes, Rala. And you're Richard. I am Richard, yes. We knew each other at the Groundlings, remember? Right. Oh, he was so cute. Last time I had seen him was eight years before. He was crush material back then. Just adorable, skinny, tousled, curly-topped, turtleneck-wearing, a very talented and funny guy who had just come out from New York with his best friend, Bobby, who played Juan Epstein on Welcome Back, Cotter. We had been in the Groundlings eight years earlier. We were in an improvisational song class together where you're thrown a line in a musical style and you have to make up a song on the spot. Then I remembered her boyfriend was Gary Austin, our director and the guy who started the Groundlings. Since she wasn't a casting director and my future career hopes were just now destroyed, I easily shifted to a new tack. She was so pretty, had such a great smile and such a wonderful happy air about her, I casually asked the only question that I was really interested in at this point. So, are you still going with Gary? No, we broke up four years ago. So we easily chatted and yakked about all kinds of stuff. It was nice, but I wasn't compelled to change where I was sitting at dinner to have more time with him. And he got a kick out of the fact that the Helen who invited me and would have been my date was Helen Hunt. Toward the end of the night, Richard came to the table, asked me for my number, and if I'd like to get together. The benefit was on a Monday night, August 25th, 1986. I didn't want to look too eager, so I waited a whole two days before I called her. Wednesday night, he called and asked me out for the following Saturday. Three months later, we were married. Helen was a bridesmaid in our wedding. Three and a half years later, our son Chase was born. And this May 31st, we'll be celebrating 28 years of marriage. <laughs> oh, I love that. Deserves an all. Oh. But remember, it was all very simple. Serendipity and synchronicity, meeting at the intersection of wow and boo, brings the unexpected puzzle pieces of life together in unplanned magic. We first met in an improv class, but this event that neither of us really wanted to attend brought two star-crossed soulmates together for the second time. And this time we got married and began a life of adventure where laughter is our aphrodisiac. How, How lucky, lucky can two people get? get? Thank you. Thank you.